Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's special presentation, Current Estate Planning Opportunities, How to Have Your Cake and Eat It Too. My name is Brandon Centula. I'm the Chief Fiduciary Officer of Peak Trust Company with offices in Alaska and Nevada. As many of you know, Peak is a full-service trust company providing customized, flexible, and sophisticated solutions. We welcome the opportunity to partner with you and your clients to help them achieve their estate planning goals. Before we get started, I would like to take care of a few housekeeping items. Today's presentation is being recorded, and we will provide both the recording and slides to all attendees. Please enter any questions you have uh, into the panel, and we will address as many as possible at the end of the presentation. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Maurice Casimir, whom I have known and worked with for more than 20 years. Maurice is the founding partner of Maurice Casimir & Associates in New York City. Mr. Casimir has more than 30 years of experience formulating customized estate plans for high net worth individuals, helping hundreds of clients save millions of dollars in gift, estate, and income taxes. Maurice is an author and a frequent lecturer on sophisticated estate planning strategies and succession planning for closely held businesses. We are delighted to have him join us today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Maurice. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. I uh, wish you were having some fun today. I'd like to thank uh, Peak Trust for inviting me to speak. As you're all aware, Peak is a trust company is licensed in both Alaska and Nevada, which you'll see during today's discussion is very relevant. These are two jurisdictions that provide great estate planning and asset protection opportunities. As we speak, it strongly appears that notwithstanding our president's legal challenges, that former Vice President Biden will indeed become our next president. What is not clear is what party will control the Senate. The Republicans apparently already have 50 Senate seats with two seats in Georgia up for grabs. The runoff elections take place on January 5th. If the Republicans win just one seat, I don't anticipate many significant changes in the estate planning rules from this year to next. However, if the Democrats win both seats, Kamala Harris can break any tie as the president of the Senate. So I, that's why they're pouring in hundreds of millions of dollars into these uh, Georgia races. What we do know is that all the polls were wrong. There wasn't the blue wave most pollsters were predicting. So if the st Senate stays red, the two political parties will be forced to act in a bipartisan manner for the sake of our country in terms of dealing with COVID, healthcare, a stimulus package, and tax reform. Having said that, it doesn't seem likely there will be an immediate change to the current estate and gift tax laws. But anything is possible given the size of the deficit and our national debt. Again, we will know more on January 5th. As you are all aware, the current gift and estate tax exemption is scheduled to phase out on January 1, 2026, when it will be approximately cut in half. However, that does not mean that estate plans that are currently in progress should stop or even be slowed down or plans that have not started should be delayed. For taxpayers who love their families and those are the taxpayers who implement the state plans and for those taxpayers who want to save estate taxes for their families in the millions or tens of millions of dollars or more, the planning process needs to continue because of the current perfect storm for estate planning. Let's talk about that perfect storm. Uh, first, due to COVID, valuations of businesses and real estate in many cases have dropped substantially. I've seen residential and commercial real estate entities in Manhattan drop in value by as much as 75% since many tenants cannot afford to pay rent or have gone out of business. Due to COVID, valuation discounts are higher than usual due to increased risk and uncertainty. The estate tax exemption is currently 11.58 million per person, and it's going to 11.7 on January 1, or $23.4 million per married couple. 
That's an enormous amount of money. With valuation discounts, this exemption can be leveraged substantially, probably well over to $30 million. With historic low interest rates and low valuations, assets can be sold to defective grantor trusts with any appreciation above the AFR rate growing out of the estate. The November short-term interest rate, the AFR, which is three years or less, is 13 basis points. The midterm rate, three to nine, is 39 basis points. And the long-term rate is 1.17%. These are historically low interest rates. And the 75-20 rate for GRATS and other split interest trusts are only 0.47%. Another reason this is a perfect storm is that GRATs work great in a low interest rate environment. Under the grantor trust rules, the grantor can pay income taxes for a defective grantor trust, such as a GRAT or an intentionally defective grantor trust to further reduce the exemption. Taking advantage of the grantor trust rules over time is the absolute best way to shrink an estate. And then again, we have the power of compounding. The earlier assets move out of the estate, usually the better estate planning result there is. So let's just talk one more time, review quickly what that perfect storm is. It's a reduction in values, it's increase in discounts, it's the historically high exemption, it's historically low interest rates, it's the grantor trust rules and the power of compounding. This is the perfect storm why people should be planning now. Now, even though the exemption doesn't change for maybe five years, potentially, although you never know, taking advantage of these low interest rates and historically low values is the, in fact, the perfect storm for estate planning. Um, Boy, sorry to interrupt. Could you um, just move the slides at, uh, for us? I apologize. Hey, no worries. Okay, let's talk about different kinds of clients that we all have. We call, I call the, uh, I made up this term, estate planning continuum. There are people on one side of the continuum who don't want to do any estate planning. They like looking at their balance sheet and it's their opinion that when they die, estate taxes will be paid and that's okay because their children will get more than they started with. And that's certainly a legitimate position. Not a big fan of those clients because I can't do a lot of work. On the other end of the spectrum are the clients who say, I've worked very hard. I love my kids, I love my grandkids, and I'm probably gonna love my great grandkids. I wanna do whatever I can to make sure that I pay as little estate tax as possible. And I love those clients because we can do a lot of work. And then you have clients who are in the middle, clients who like looking at their balance sheet, wanna do some estate planning, maybe even buy some life insurance to cover the tax. And all these are legitimate positions. We don't know what client is gonna do what until they walk in the door and you start having a conversation. So it's important to know the philosophy of your particular client and implement those goals. It's our job as, as advisors to provide the menu to our clients to say, tell them what estate planning techniques are available. So let's get into the, uh, the technical aspects of the program, because even if the Republicans keep the Senate under a Biden administration, there may be changes in estate planning that could be detrimental to the estate planning process, such as an elimination of valuation discounts on intrafamily transfers and a potential rise in interest rates. So we have a client on the, uh, on the far side of the spectrum, the people who really want to do estate planning for their families, what's the objective? The objective is to use their exemptions to the extent that they are willing to do so. And as we said before, for a married couple, the exemption is uh, $23.16 million this year and $23.4 million next year. Uh, just to repeat a little bit, again, to get these transactions completed, most clients need to obtain the services of an appraiser. And often it's a two-step process in getting an appraisal. 
because these clients own interests in entities such as LLCs. They may become members in LLCs that own real estate as an example, or they own S corps that own businesses. So typically you have a two-step process when it comes to valuation. First, you have to value the underlying asset. And then two, you have to value the entity. And that's the entity valuation where you get the valuation discounts for minority interest or lack of marketability, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just gonna move you over here. Okay, and these circumstances, as we said before, are creating this perfect storm for estate planning. Valuations are way down. Um, and let's talk about, we're gonna start talking about the situation where you can transfer assets away but still maintain substantial uh, control over those assets. So let's take an example where you have a business owner and let's say the business is an S corp. Typically what we do is we file a uh, amendment to the certificate of incorporation. We do a recap and we create two classes of stock, voting and non-voting shares. And typically it's the non-voting shares that will be appraised where the client maintains the voting shares. So since we're valuing non-voting shares, a, an appraiser will be able to layer on a substantial valuation discount. All the while, the client maintains the voting shares and makes all decisions regarding the operations of the business, including salary, bonuses, anything like that. And that same issue can apply for LLCs, where we convert the LLC interest into either voting management units and non-voting units, or manager-managed LLCs versus member-managed LLCs. And when you build in those changes to the operating agreements, similar to amending a certificate of incorporation of an S-Corp, appraisers will take valuation discounts in a substantial percentage. There was a case in 2017 called Powell that came out of the tax court. And that case held where a transferor retained too much power in an LLC regarding distributions and liquidations of that LLC, they were going to bring the asset back into the estate under 2036. So nowadays, when we draft operating agreements, we bifurcate the management function into an investments management function. And that could be with our client, but the distributions and liquidations decisions must be by a, a, a third party. And this way we can avoid 2036 inclusion as laid out in uh, Powell. So that's kind of a basic understanding of how we set up the structures, but let's get into more specifics. I know a lot of people are interested in doing GRATs. And what is a GRAT? A GRAT is a codified estate planning technique on the chapter 14 of the Internal Revenue Code. It's a trust, a grantor retained annuity trust where a grantor contributes assets to that trust and maintains a specific annuity for a specific term of years. So you transfer assets to the trust and then the trust pays back the grantor an annuity in a specific amount for a specific term of years. The assets remaining in the grant at the end of the trust term will pass to the next generation without gift or estate taxes. And that's a great estate planning techniques. What are the risks of a grant? The risks of a grant are it fails if the grantor dies during the term of the grant. So typically you see two year grants or a series of rolling grants. Another problem with doing a grant is that you cannot implement a generation skipping plan in the, in the beginning. There may be ways to convert it down the road, but you can't do it in the beginning. With the current low interest rate environment, where the 75-20 rate is only 0.47%, any growth in the GRAT above 0.47% will pass to the next generation without gift or estate taxes. So GRATs can be a great estate planning technique, realizing that if the grantor dies during the term, um, you have, you've, the, the plan has failed and you cannot implement the generation skipping plan. So let's go to a specific example. And this is one way where a client can have his or her cake and eat it too. 
let's say we had a, a, a business or a piece of real estate where the gross value was $5 million, but after discounts was worth three and a half million dollars. And let's say as an example, the client transfers that asset to a GRAT and retains an annuity of about $357,000 a year for a 10 year period. As you can see, the amount retained, which is $3,570,000, when you present value it back at a 0.47% interest rate, the client has retained everything that he's contributed or she's contributed to the trust. So any growth above 0.47% will pass to the next generation without gift taxes. So one way you can have your cake and eat it too is that, well, I've transferred assets to a trust. I've retained the right to receive $357,000 a year, but all the growth above what I've retained will go to my family without gift or estate taxes. Assuming a 6% rate of return and assuming the gross value prior to discounts, there should be about $4 million left in that grad at the end of the 10 year term, which will pass to the family gift and estate tax free. So that's one way clients can implement an estate plan, keep something, but pass future growth outside of the estate. Let's move on now. So that's just a grat. A grat is a technique which is, as I said before, is codified. If the IRS came in and questioned the size of the valuation discount, or the underlying value of the asset, the code provides an automatic adjustment provision inside of the trust, whereby the annuity would change to keep the gift at zero. Under our facts, the client kept as much as he gave, so the value for gift tax purposes was in fact zero. So that transaction did not use any lifetime exemption or annual exclusion. Uh, the better planning technique, in my opinion, is making taxable gifts in dynastic trusts and start using the current generous gift tax exemption of $11.58 million. And as we spoke about before, we want to maximize the size of the exemption. We want to take advantage of the fact that values of certain assets have gone down. We want to take advantage of the fact that market discounts have gone out, have gone increased. And when it comes to businesses, appraisers are using lower multiples of EBITDA and determining valuation. So this is how we can leverage the $23.16 million exemption for a married couple. Now, given the size of the debt and the national deficit, um, we want to use this exemption while we can. And do and again, due to the power of compounding, the earlier you get started, the, va uh, the better, because current low values have a much better chance of appreciating faster. Assets that have higher valuation discounts also have the opportunity to appreciate faster. And the earlier you give away assets, the earlier the family can enjoy the power of compounding. And as you can see that Albert Einstein said, or was reputed to say, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it, he who doesn't pays it. And I've been doing these estate plans as Brandon said before, over 30 years. When you start transferring assets uh, early on, over the lifetime of the uh, client, it's amazing how these assets compound, particularly when you take into account the leverage you get with valuation discounts, but more importantly, the grantor trust rules where the taxpayer, the client is paying the tax for the trust so that the trust can grow without reduction for taxes. And while the grantor is paying the tax, the grantor's other assets get reduced in value. And over time, it's quite remarkable that a client can actually die broke and leave tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars gift and estate tax free in a dynastic trust for the benefit of their family. So that's why I have this slide called the most powerful tool in estate planning, the intentionally defective grantor trust. 
And here we are, we're starting on again, the topic of how do I give assets away and have access to some of the money while I'm alive in case my estate planner is so good that I end up broke. And one of the ways, a typical structure is where a client creates a slat. A slat is a spousal limited access trust. A spousal limited access trust is a trust in which an individual creates a trust for the benefit of his or her spouse and perhaps their children and ultimately grandchildren and more remote descendants. So if a spouse is a beneficiary, then the client, the grantor, arguably retains indirect access to the assets in that trust because an independent trustee can make distributions to the spouse. So a trustee can write a check to a spouse for his or her health support and maintenance. And depending upon how the trust is drafted or whether they're gonna split the gift or not, and we could talk about gift splitting in a little while, um, that check can be deposited in a joint bank account. So that's a simple way of how a client can create a state plan and have their cake and eat it. But what's the problem with a slat? Slat is that there could be a divorce so that if there is no spouse, assets cannot be paid to the spouse and, and accessed. What if the spouse dies before the grantor of the trust? Then the grantor of the trust no longer has access to those assets as well. So that's problematic. So the typical plan these days when you have your cake and eat it too is creating two slats. And you could see this somewhat complicated schematic, but it's really not that complicated. Spouse number one creates a dynastic trust for the benefit of spouse number two and the kids. And spouse number two creates a dynastic trust for spouse number one and the kids. Now I know what you're all thinking. The IRS does not like reciprocal or mirror image trusts, and that is true. So what we wanna do is we wanna make sufficient differences in these two trusts so that the IRS could not or would not say that these are reciprocal or mirror image trusts. So how do we do that? We may create trusts in different jurisdictions. If a client wants maximum estate planning and generation skipping planning opportunities, maybe one trust is created in Alaska, maybe another trust is created in Nevada. We have different independent trustees who make distribution decisions. We build provisions within the trust documents such as general, you know, uh, limited powers of appointments or charities. We add other beneficiaries to one trust and not another trust. And we compound these differences sufficiently so that the IRS could not argue that or not successfully argue that these are reciprocal trusts. So now you have two trusts. Spouse number one potentially funds the trust with a gift of 11.58 million, or maybe more when you factor in valuation discounts. And trust number two also funds a dynastic trust, likely in another jurisdiction, and funds it with 11.58 million, also leveraged to take into account valuation discounts. Now, what we also do, as you can see on the far right, is that the trust does not necessarily have to have the assets themselves. I mean, if you create a trust in Alaska or Nevada, let's say, with Peak Trust Company as the administrative trust trustee, if the assets in the trust are sitting uh, directly in the trust as opposed to a sub-entity, the fees involved or the fiduciary trustee fees will be very significant. However, if you wanna minimize those fees while at the same time keeping investment control over the assets in trust number one and trust number two, the trusts can have sub LLCs holding the assets. So for example, in trust number one, uh, let's say the grantor created an LLC, funded the, funded the LLC with 
pick a number, $13 million of real estate, marketable securities, et cetera. And then they went out and they got a valuation discount. And let's say it came below 11.58 million. Then that entity would be gifted to the trust to use the gift tax exemption. So now the assets are sitting in an LLC, which is owned by an Alaska trust, as an example. Now, going back to Powell, if the grantor of that trust has total control over that LLC, it's likely when that grantor dies, assuming there is an audit of the estate tax return, then the IRS would bring that entire LLC back into the estate under Section 2036. So what do we do to prevent that? Number one, we draft the LLC with two managers. We bifurcate the management function between an investments manager and a manager who's in charge of distributions and liquidations. Our client, the grantor of the trust, can actually be the investments manager. So the client can give away all these assets and maintain investment control without inclusion in the estate. However, any decisions regarding a distribution from the LLC up into the trust or a liquidation of the LLC must be given to a separate distributions manager. So that structure will enable the client to maintain control or investment control over the assets. And with this two-tier dynastic structure, where again, just to recall, one trust created uh, an entity in Alaska and the other trust was created in Nevada. Each trust has a separate LLC, which is under the investment control of our client to avoid reciprocal trust issues, we have two different distributions trustees. We may even create the two LLCs in separate jurisdictions. Maybe the LLC is created in Alaska, maybe one's created in Nevada, maybe one's created in Delaware. I like Delaware particularly for LLCs because they have a, such a long history of case law for handling LLCs, particularly under asset protection. And they have this court of chancellery, which has been in existence for actually centuries. So this is a great structure whereby you can see that number one, the client maintains investment control through the LLCs. The distributions decisions are separate independent managers, two separate ones in this case. And if we want to make a distribution from a trust to a beneficiary, a number of things has to happen. Number one, the distributions manager in the LLC has to agree to make a distribution from the LLC up into the trust. And then the independent trustee would make, decide to make a distribution out of the trust to a beneficiary. And that's the typical structure. It looks complicated, but in practice, it is really not complicated. But in this structure, how do we have our cake and eat it too? Well, under trust number one, one of the spouses is a beneficiary. Under trust number two, the other spouse is a beneficiary. Now, I would never recommend from starting from day one that these distributions to the spouses occur. I would hope that there are other assets that the spouses can live on because we don't want a implied or perceived agreement between the grantors and the trustees to receive distributions. And if you do that, the IRS could argue 2036 inclusion issues. And this is a very important issue. So it's not just the creation of the documents that's so important by drafting these elaborate dynastic trusts in Alaska and Nevada, but also creating properly drafted operating agreements for the LLCs. But in practice, in the actual administration of the LLCs and the trusts, there'd be communication between the clients and us whether it's the lawyers, the accountants, the financial advisors, the trust companies, et cetera, et cetera, so that the trusts and LLCs are administered correctly, not to give the government an argument to make to cause inclusion in the estate down the road. And I hope that's uh, very clear. That's a very important thing. It's the, it's, it's the creation of the documents, 
as well as the administration of the plan. And it, it can't be emphasized enough to have that kind of communication between the client. The clients that get on the phone and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. And they call the client or the accountant or the investment advisor or the trust company and they get on a phone call with a team that they can come up with an answer and say, hey, you know, it'd be better if you do it this way or it'd be better if you do it that way. As opposed to those clients who just do stuff without telling their advisors and potentially mess up the structure at the end of the day. And I'm sure uh, a number of you will have questions on that. So again, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, also talk about how to leverage the uh, gift tax exemption. As you saw before, Spouse number one made a gift of $11.58 million to the first trust. Spouse number two made a gift of $11.58 million to the other trust. What, so while they're both alive, theoretically, they have access to the, all the income from both trusts. And as I said before, there should be no actual distributions unless absolutely necessary, because we don't want an implied understanding, which create a 2036 problem. But let's say you have a very wealthy client, somebody worth significantly more than $23.4 million. How do, we, how do we shrink that estate? And that's the greatest thing about dynastic trusts is that the client can now, let's say the LLC didn't have a value of 11.58 million. Let's say the LLC had a value of $50 million. Well, the client can make a gift of the $11.58 million, and maybe you build in a cushion in case of, a, of an audit. And we'll talk about laundry clauses in a little while, define value formulas. But then the client can sell the balance of the LLC, let's say it's worth 30 or $40 million to the trust in exchange for a promissory note. Now, what we do know is that if we do a sale like that, the sale to the trust is not a taxable event because sales between a grantor and a grantor's intentionally defective grantor trust is not an income taxable event. That's really quite remarkable. You could look at revenue ruling 2004-6 and over time through the income earned by the LLC, the note will be paid off. But what have we done, which is so important? Number one, we've locked in a discounted value so that any appreciation above that discounted value that's locked into the promissory note won't be part of the taxable estate. Two, we've locked it in an incredibly low interest rate. So if you, if you did a, um, a nine-year note, which is a midterm rate, 0.39%. If you did a long-term rate, which is more than 15, you have 15, you know, which is more than nine years, it's 1.17%. So even a long-term rate would be a, an incredible thing to lock in. Over time, income generated by the LLC will be distributed to the trust and the trust will pay down the note. And it's important in the administration of the trust that that note gets serviced. But any growth above those interest rates, when you factor in the discounts and the grantor trust rules, will inure to the benefit of the family. And in these dynastic trusts, Alaska has a perpetuities period of a thousand years. That's kind of a long time. Uh, Nevada has a perpetuities period of 365 years. That's, that's a long time too. So it, theoretically with this reverse slat structure, you can give all your assets away. Anything above the exemptions you can do via sales to the dynasty grantor trusts, keep notes. And through the grantor trust rules, those notes will disappear because the client has to live and pay income taxes for not just him or herself, but for the trust as well. Wow. I mean, you may remember when Trump took office early on, he had a financial uh, economic advisor by the name of Gary Cohen. And Gary Cohen once said, only idiots pay estate tax. And actually for clients who are on the right side of the estate planning spectrum, nothing could be more true. Nothing could be more true. So you sell for the note, the cash flow is used to service the note, the client continues to pay income taxes for the trust, and slowly but surely, the remaining estate gets shrinks, shrinks to zero. 
Uh, as we talked about before, you have some you, the client for a grad who created a grad can have their cake and eat it too by retaining an annuity payment. I'm a much bigger fan of using dynastic trusts because you don't have to survive the term and you can do dynastic planning. With grats, those two things are always get in the way. Um, let's talk about, because we are moving along very quickly and we got a few other things to cover. Let's talk about gift tax exposure when you do a gift or a sale of an asset like an LLC interest to a grantor trust. As we talked about the GRAT before, there's an automatic adjustment provision inside of the GRAT, which is permissible under the Internal Revenue Code in Chapter 14, which causes a change in the annuity payment in case there's a valuation change as a result of a gift tax order. And that's wonderful because clients really don't want to pay gift taxes if they don't have to but we can talk about a little in a little while while paying gift tax is actually better than paying estate tax. When you do a gift to a dynastic trust, it's not a codified estate planning technique. It has evolved over time by tax lawyers and other advisors. But there was a case that came down in the tax code called Wandry, which basically approved a defined value formula which basically said if you, if you draft your documents correctly that when you gift and or sell, you're gifting a specific dollar amount, which is represented by a percentage of the LLC interest, but you're giving a specific dollar amount of the LLC interest. If the IRS comes in and audits the return, since you've only given away a specific dollar amount, then a certain amount of the LLC interest being transferred would have to be returned to the grantor to keep the gift or the sale within the specific dollar amount. These are called defined value formulas or wandry formulas. And we put them in every document that we do a sale or a gift to a dynastic trust. It was unclear whether these wandry clauses would be accepted by the IRS. They have never, IRS has never acquiesced to a wandry clause or a defined value formula. However, I can tell you through experience that we have settled cases under a defined value formula because I think the IRS understands that it is a correct and, and approved estate planning technique. There was a case that came down earlier this summer called Nelson where the defined value formula was not properly drafted because it wasn't tied into a specific dollar amount. And that formula failed. But while, while the taxpayer lost in that case, it was actually a good thing for us because we knew that properly drafted wandry formulas actually work. So that's something you should keep in mind. Another thing you should think about, about doing estate planning is that when you make a transfer of an asset, whether it's to a GRAT or a defective grantor trust, whether it's uh, in New York or Alaska or Nevada, there is no step up in basis at death. So for clients whose estates are not large, it may not be appropriate to give away all these assets because of the loss of the step up in basis. So you have to balance the income tax consequences with the projected gift and estate tax savings. So every client is different. So you have to be very careful in getting factual information from the clients, see where their assets fall in, what's most important to them. How do I structure things to maximize a basis step up while at the same time maybe doing some estate planning? Every client's different and there's no cookie cutter answer for clients. So we need to be uh, very sensitive to our clients' needs, have conversations as to what we're doing and to see what they're trying to achieve. Now I'd like to move into the concept of a self-settled trust. This is another estate planning technique where you can have your cake and eat it too. And this technique for whatever reason is not widely used by estate planners, but the law in this area seems quite clear. This technique is appropriate to implement for individuals who, for whatever reason, do not or cannot do slats. Maybe there's no spouse, or maybe they're divorced, maybe they, they were never married and don't have children yet, but they want to do some estate planning and take advantage of the asset protection rules that Nevada 
and Alaska afford. And they still want to remove assets from their estate because they want to start the process of estate planning because they know one day they may have children or grandchildren. They want to get this process going. So this technique involves a grantor creating a self-settled trust in an asset protection jurisdiction such as Alaska or Nevada, whereby the transfer to the trust by the grantor is a completed gift for gift tax purposes, even though the grantor is still a potential beneficiary where the assets of the trust are not included in the grantor's gross estate at death, where distributions to the grantor are entirely within the discretion of an independent trustee, and most importantly, under state law and the terms of the trust document, the assets of the trust cannot be reached by the grantor's creditors. You know, there's general legal agreement that any trust an individual creates or quote unquote settles for the benefit of himself or herself, a self-settled trust, is subject to the claims of the grantor, the creditors of the grantor. Where this is the case, any transfer a grantor makes to this type of trust is generally recognized as not being a completed gift for gift tax purposes. And the assets in this type of self-settled trust, which is subject to the claims of the grantor's creditors, will be included in the grantor's gross estate under 2036A1 because if the creditors can reach a trust, the grantor is deemed to have retained the use or enjoyment over the assets transferred. However, in April 1997, this, the law in this area really started to change or take root. Alaska adopted a statute AS 34.40.110, which provides that if a trust contains transfer restrictions, the assets in the trust are not subject to the claims of the grantor's creditors unless the grantor may revoke or terminate the trust, the grantor intends to defraud a creditor, the grantor is in default of child support payments for more than 30 days, or the trust requires that income or corpus be distributed to the grantor. A well-known and esteemed former trust and estates attorney from New York and my friend Jonathan Blotmacher was substantially responsible for the enactment of this statute. And a lot of the things we do today are, can be attributed back to Jonathan over the years. And I'm grateful for his friendship. Under the category of having your cake and eating it too, the question is whether an individual can create a self-settled trust cited under a state like Alaska or Nevada with clear asset protection statutes, whereby the terms of the trust allow an independent trustee in the exercise of his or her absolute discretion to make a distribution of trust assets to the grantor and the transfer of the assets to that trust by the grantor is a completed gift for gift, inc for inc uh, gift tax purposes and at the same time will not be includable in the estate of the grantor upon the, the grantor's death? And the answer is yes, provided the trust is drafted and administered correctly, in part meaning the trust agreement must contain a restriction which prevents the grantor from being able to assign any interest he or she may have in the trust to his or her creditors under state law or the trust document. And therefore the grantor's creditors cannot reach the trust assets. Only then, only then with a proper state statute will the trust assets not be subject to the claims of the grantor's creditors. There was a revenue lien back in 77 where the IRS ruled that a taxpayer made a completed gift to a trust where distributions to the grantor of a self-settled trust were entirely in the discretion of the trustee and under state law, the grantor's creditors could not reach the trust assets. There was a 1998 PLR, uh, 983707, which provided another example of a taxpayer creating a self-settled trust where the IRS treated the transfer to the trust as a completed gift for gift tax purposes. Interestingly, the crux of the analysis surrounding the asset protection and estate planning effectiveness of a self-settled trust hinges on whether creditors can attach themselves to the assets of the trust, either by state law or the trust agreement itself. As stated, and I may be repeating myself, but it's worth repeating, the goal is for transfers made into a self-settled trust to be completed for estate and gift tax purposes. If creditors can reach the assets either under state law or the terms of the trust, 
the transfer is incomplete and the trust will be included in the grantor's taxable estate. The transfer to a self-settled trust is deemed incomplete if trust assets can be what's called relegated to the grantor's creditors. In most states, creditors have access to at least some portion of the assets in a self-settled trust. That is not the case in states like Alaska and Nevada that have specific legislation. Thus, given that creditor access is the key determinator, if a client wishes to pursue this type of planning, it would be advisable to create a self-settled trust only in a state like Alaska or Nevada where it is clear creditors of the grantor do not have access to the trust assets. In addition to state law providing creditor access, the trust needs to be drafted to make sure the gift is complete. And there are no other string provisions under 2036 through 2038 that would cause inclusion in the estate. So let's just run through some of those. The trust cannot require any mandatory distributions be made to the grantor. Everything must be entirely voluntary with the independent trustee. Maybe further restricting a trustee's discretion, either by a hem standard or the consent of an adverse party may be helpful. And I say may, because there was another case, the state of German, it seemed requiring the consent of an adverse party before making addition to the grantor did not seem to be a factor in the court's decision that it was a completed gift. However, optically, it looks good. We wanna make sure the language in the trust does not allow using trust assets to satisfy a legal obligation of support of the grantor, such as child support or divorce payments. And the next one is really critical. To make sure the gift is complete, there can be no evidence of an implied understanding between the grantor and the trustee that the grantor will receive distributions from the trust. If implied understanding between the grantor and the trustee is found, you have 2036 problems. Therefore, it's highly recommended that no distributions be made. And just like the slats we talked about before, that the self-settled trust be a fund of last resort. Um, while uh, Rev Rule 2004-64 held that a discretionary reimbursement provision to reimburse the grantor for income, income taxes paid is not by itself a, a factor in a state tax inclusion, consideration should be given whether a reimbursement provision should be included in a self-settled trust. Grantor should not have a power of appointment over trust assets. There should be a, a, a trustee that's truly independent. Maybe the grantor is not a beneficiary if the grantor is married, and maybe the grantor only becomes a beneficiary if, if he or she ceases to be married. Maybe you draft in a provision which gives the right to somebody to remove the grantor as a trustee. And the grantor should not have control over any of the uh, trust assets. So in addition to 2004-64 that you should all read, which stands for a lot of things like the grantor paying income taxes for a dynastic trust is not an additional gift for gift tax purposes. There's a lot that goes into the self-settled trust area that you can find in that revenue ruling. You could also read private letter ruling 2009-44002, which obviously is a not, can be relied on as precedent, but will give you a greater understanding of the self-settled trust area. There's also a great article in a state planning magazine, which came out in 2010, which was written by Gideon Rothschild and Doug Blattmacher, Mitch Gans and Jonathan Blattmacher, which analyzes that revenue ruling 2009-44-002. That's an excellent article if you wanna proceed with a self-settled trust estate planning strategy. And it's important to note that people outside of Alaska and Nevada can create trusts in Alaska and Nevada. That's why you hire the services of a trust company. So why do people create self-settled trusts? Asset protection is typically the most common reason. Transferring assets, you know, your assets to a trust will shield your clients' creditors from trust assets, as we've learned, but also removes assets from the taxable estate. If you do not expect any risk of creditors in your future, such a trust may be unnecessary. However, certain circumstances could put your wealth at risk. I mean, anybody can sue anybody for anything these days. 
could be an accident or an injury. If you worry that a personal, a future personal injury lawsuit might put your assets at risk, a self-settled trust is a great idea. High risk professions like lawyers, doctors, architects, real estate developers, builders, accountants, or other executives. A self-settled trust may protect your assets from being reached by a work-related litigation. Same thing with business ownership. Certain businesses lend themselves to lawsuit. So not only will the self-settled trust give you substantial asset protection, at the same time, it could remove assets from your estate, your taxable estate. So it's a wonderful estate planning strategy for the right client. Uh, but you shouldn't be doing these things if you're in the middle of a divorce or you're trying to escape child support payments or alimony or anything like that. You never know what a court might rule. They may, they may deep into the trust or dig into the trust and force a trustee to make a distribution to satisfy obligations of support. The bottom line is that a properly drafted and administered self-settled trust created under the laws of an asset protection jurisdiction can not only enhance your creditor protection, but also remove the trust assets and future appreciation from being subject to estate taxes. While an independent trustee retains a discretionary power to make distributions back to the grantor. That is indeed having your cake and eating it too. Just like having the slats we spoke about before where distributions can be made to one spouse or the other, you truly can implement an estate plan, retain some level of control and have your cake and eat it too at the same time. And Brandon, I think I've run out of time. Barbara? Yes, we have a ton of questions. Um, <laughs> a lot of really good ones actually. Brandon, do you see them? That's a lot of information I, I do, in a yeah. short period of time. Yes, absolutely, Maurice, and thank you so much for your excellent presentation. You've shown once again that you really are a subject matter expert. We do have uh, a few minutes for some questions. Uh, our first question is as follows. Uh, both Sanders and Obama proposed getting rid of grantor trusts. Are you concerned about using grantor trusts in light of the possible termination of those ad advantages with substantial transfer tax consequences? Well, at the moment, I, I'm, I'm not as concerned as I might have been. Again, since it's likely that the Republicans will keep the Senate, we are moving uh, full speed ahead by creating as many grantor trusts as we can. I think every client of, of wealth should have a grantor trust because it creates enormous flexibility. If there is a change in the grantor trust rules down the law, we don't have any idea if it can be treated retroactively, but since we, since it's likely nothing will happen for the next five years, I would move full speed ahead with the grantor trust planning. Perfect. Thank you. What is the effect on the basis of the assets either sold or purchased when using a grantor trust? Yeah. So I, as I touched on uh, during the lecture, um, when you transfer an asset to an irrevocable trust that's not includable in your estate at death, there is no step up in basis. Section 1014 says that there is only a step up in basis for assets that are includable in your estate at death. So assets transferred or sold to an irrevocable grantor trust will not get a step up in basis. But that doesn't mean we don't have planning opportunities. A client may want to consider buying the, the low basis assets back from the grantor trust prior to death, maybe swapping high basis assets with the low basis assets sitting in the trust. And that could create an opportunity where you again, you have your cake and eat it too. You got assets of your estate down the road, you swapped high, high basis assets for low basis assets that are in the trust. And you did enjoy a step up, assuming we have a step up in basis law at that time, as, as we all know that uh, Biden has proposed the elimination of the step up in basis. Thank you, Maurice. Um, <clears throat> You talked a bit about slats. How do you manage the risk of divorce when using a slat? You know, that's a really great question. And you got to spend at least a few minutes with the client when you're doing these double slats. I mean, quite often when a client creates an intentionally defective grant to a trust, they define a spouse as the person to whom they're married and living with at the time of a particular event. 
But you know, <clears throat> using a slat might um, reduce or eliminate a, a, another spouse's equitable distributions rights or community property rights. So often what we do is what's kind of good for the goose is good for the gander. When we draft these two slats, a lot of times we define the spouse as the particular spouse at the moment we created the trust. And that spouse will continue as a beneficiary of that trust regardless of marital status. So that's something that we give a lot of thought to. Great, thank you. Do you use Maurice's irrevocable life insurance trust? Every day, every day of my life for the last 35 years, of course. <laughs> Because we don't, you know, what an irrevocable life insurance trust does, it eliminates incidents of ownership in the grantor upon whose life the policy was purchased. So under um, Section 2042, the uh, proceeds will not be includable in the estate of the grantor. So the answer is yes, of course. Great. And by the way, Maurice. the potentially defective grantor trust that we create they can own any asset. It just doesn't have to be securities or a business. It could also own life insurance. These these trusts are multi-purposeful. You don't need Absolutely. a separate you don't need a separate trust for each transaction. Uh, as somebody who sits on the the side of the table where where we administer trusts, we see that all the time. You're absolutely right. So, Maurice, do you ever recommend any type of hybrid DAP for you know as an alternative to a self-settled trust? Well, listen, of I course, I mean, you could you can have a, a DAP, which is for other people who are not aware, a domestic asset protection trust where the transfer to the trust is not a completed gift for gift tax purposes. You're setting up the trust exclusively for asset protection. And in that case, in order to draft it that way and, and words really matter when it comes to trust and estate planning. But in that case, the grantor typically retains a power of appointment over the trust assets. So the gift is deemed incomplete for gift tax purposes. So you can have a DAPT, which is solely for asset protection, or you can have a DAPT slash self-settled trust, which is for asset protection and wealth transfer. Absolutely. Uh, the question is this, Maurice. The gentleman has a client who is a New York resident is 86 years old and his wife died three years ago with an estate consisting solely of jointly held property, including a joint interest in LLC holding commercial real estate. The estate tax return was filed at the first death to preserve portability. The current value of the LLC is about $10 million. Total assets are around $11.5 million. Client lives off the income provided by the LLC. What do you recommend for options here? Well, that client may be a, a great candidate for this self-settled trust because of the portability, which was three years ago. That was 2017. So the higher exemption didn't go into effect until 2018. So we had, let's say, five and a half million dollars, which was ported over to the surviving spouse. The spouse has $11.58 million of exemption using the combined exemption of $16 million, which is in excess of the remaining assets in a self-settled trust, seems like a very good strategy for this particular client who does not have a spouse and where a slat is not appropriate. And there's Thank always you. a balance. I think you've... There's always a balance. Absolutely. I mean, the client doesn't have to give everything away because you have to remember you have security issues, right? If distributions in a self-settled trust are totally within the discretion of an independent trustee, you know, maybe the client doesn't want to give away every nickel. Maybe the client gives away $8 million and keeps $3 million and lives off the $3 million. Depending upon the age and the health of the individual, things can change. You're right. That makes perfect sense. I think you may have already answered this uh, in relation to another Another question. This question is, what is the tax treatment for a contribution of low cost or low basis assets into a Nevada self settled trust? Well, since the trust is a grantor trust for income tax purposes, there are no income tax consequences. 
the only time you could potentially have an income, uh, some kind of tax consequence is a, is a state like New York or New York City, where when you transfer more than 49% of an entity that owns commercial real estate that's subject to a mortgage, you may have a real property transfer tax. But for income tax purposes, there, is no, there are no tax consequences when you make a transfer to a, a grantor trust. Well, thank you, Maurice. It looks like we've gone slightly over our time. We have lots of uh, continuing questions, which I think we'll have to get to afterwards. Just a reminder for all of the attendees today, remember that this presentation has been recorded um, <clears throat> in both the recording and the slides will be sent to all attendees. Uh, we thank you again, Maurice, for, for all of your uh, excellent points and your fantastic presentation. We wish everybody a great day. Stay safe, and again, thank you for attending. Thanks, Brandon.